Good morning. Today's lecture is on the Renaissance, and I'm going to warn you, it's going to be a little bit longer than most of our lectures, but that's because it's covering a lot of stuff. So I'll try to keep it interesting. And the first topic we're going to talk about is the Hundred Years' War. Now, first thing you might notice, it's not a hundred years, it's actually more like 116 years. And secondly, this in many ways is the the turning point between the Middle Ages and the Renaissance years. All right, there's two different things you got to know about the origins of the war. There's the long-term issue and then the immediate issue. So make sure you know the difference for the final exam. The long-term issue, uh, first of all, at one point in time, the English actually controlled more of France than the French did. And the English had been losing it over time, and they continually wanted to come back to France and reclaim territory that they thought was theirs. On the other hand, the French, they want to make the English leave, so the French are going to try and capture as much land as possible and push the English out of the country. A third long-term cause has to do with sheep and wool. Uh, the area of Belgium uh, used to be known as Flanders. That's where the English sent all their wool to be turned into cloth and into thread. That's also the same part of the world that France was trying to take over, and there was some competition there. Uh, fourth thing, chivalry. Knights in shining armor, you know, they're always wanting to gain that honor so that their armor can be shining. And there's only so many damsels in distress. There's only so many princesses in a castle. And when you've saved everybody and, and you know, covered every mud puddle, you got to get honor somewhere else, and that's going to be the battlefield. Then last but not least, uh, internal issues. Whenever a country has social issues, economic issues, political issues, any sort of internal problem, very often they will cause a problem elsewhere and then rally all the troops together, rally all the people together for like patriotic reasons. And that happens in several places in this war. Now, as far as the immediate cause goes, it's quite simply a dispute over the French throne. And here's a very poorly drawn family tree. You got Philip III of France. He has a kid who becomes king. Philip III dies. Philip IV becomes king. The way that the French monarchy worked is the crown passed to the oldest male. Now, it could go through the female line as well, but it was always a male. And since Philip IV was the oldest male, he got the crown. Philip IV had a child, so according to the rules, his oldest son, Louis X, will become king when Philip IV dies, and that's what happens. So Louis X is the next king. Louis X has a son, so it goes to the firstborn son on that line, John I. John I did not have a son. John I didn't have any kids that I know of. Therefore, you have to find the next closest male relative, which, if you go up the chart, Philip V was the uncle of John I. So Philip V becomes king after John I dies. Philip V, he did have a son. His son is named Charles, but Charles passes away while Philip V is still king. So Charles, no kids there. So what do you do next? You go back up the line and you find the nearest relative, which was Isabella of Venois. However, Isabella of Venois, she can't be king. Her husband can, though, because you could pass the crown through a female. So Edward II of England would have been the next king. He was dead, though, so that means it's Edward III. Even better, if you go up one more level, Margaret of France was Philip III's daughter. Margaret of France married Edward I of England, which gave us Edward II, which gave us Edward III. So technically, Edward III has two opportunities to be the king of France. He should be the king of France. Now, Philip III, he's got another kid, and I'm going to go back a slide. This third kid isn't on my list. I don't have him on here because there's no way at all he should ever have become king. 
because Philip IV, his line existed, those were all kings. Margaret of France, Isabella of Lenoir, there are marriages there with sons, those should be king. This third child, Charles, Charles should not have been king, but somehow his ancestors do. How does this happen? It's because after Edward III is the next in line to be king, the French change the rules. The French pass a law that suddenly says you cannot pass the crown through the female line, even though that's how it had been done for hundreds of years. Edward III, knowing he should be king, he's going to send a strongly worded letter to the French government, basically saying, I'm waiting for my crown to be delivered. And when Edward III's French crown does not get delivered, he's going to declare war on France to fight for what he believes is his. And rightfully so, it was his. Now I'm going to skip this video, but if you are interested in watching it on your own time, it's called History of England, The 100 Years War by Extra History. It's a very good one, actually. So the early years of the war. Uh, this war is fought almost completely on French soil. There is some fighting in what is today Belgium, but not very much. And the people who are leading the war, you have actual princes, actual kings, actual lords. Uh, the kings in multiple cases are out on the battlefield actually fighting. And it's one of the last wars in history where the kings and the princes are out on the battlefield themselves. It'll happen in some cases after this, but not in large numbers. Speaking of large numbers, about 10% of the population, both England and France, are going to fight, and the two armies are very different. The English army is going to be loyal to the king, and that's because the king himself pays for the army. It's going to be made up of foot soldiers, and there's going to be longbowmen. The French army, on the other hand, is going to rely on cavalry and foot soldiers, and then some crossbowmen. And the French army, it's loyal to individual lords, not the king. That's because the army is paid for by the individual lords, and then the lords will let the king borrow their army. So the English army, directly loyal to the king. The French army, directly loyal to the lords only, but not the king. That's going to play a difference here. Now, in 116 years, there's a lot of different battles, but honestly, I only want you to know three of them. There's the Battle of Crecy from 1346, the Battle of Poitiers from 1356, and the Battle of Agincourt from 1415. Now, the Battle of Crecy, is two big things that are going to happen here. Number one, it's the first time that we have the English longbow versus the French crossbow. Now, the longbow, it's about six feet tall, and it's more like a traditional bow and arrow. You pull a an arrow out of your quiver, you pull back the bow, and you shoot. A French crossbow, uh, it's a rudimentary version of the modern-day crossbow. You load it by hand. You, you have to pull back the, the, um, the string or whatever you want to call it, and you have to launch, load it, and then you shoot it much like you would a gun, and uh, it'll launch the crossbow bolt about 200 yards or so. Crossbow, extremely accurate, but it takes a long time to reload, and it has a tendency to uh, misfire. The longbow less accurate but much quicker to load. Uh, the average longbowman could let go three to four arrows for every one crossbow bolt. The longbow, uh, deadly from 100 yards, is going to pierce your armor and even from 400 yards, four football fields away, you're going to have a really bad day. So at the Battle of Crecy, you've got all these English longbowmen who are firing arrows basically as fast as they can and it knocks the French cavalry off of their boat. Oh, why did I say boats? It knocks the French cavalry off of their horses, and they fall in the mud, and there's just confusion. And then to add to this, the horses are going to be even more scared because the English are going to use very rudimentary cannons for the first time. The cannons don't really do much. I mean, it's basically just rounded rocks that you know they try to fire. But the noise, the noise is going to make the horses freak out. 
All right, you have the Battle of Poitiers. At the Battle of Poitiers, you got King John II of France actually leading an army, and he has superior power. He comes across an English army that is much smaller, but because a, a few English soldiers get behind King John II, he thinks that he's surrounded, and King John II is going to surrender. And King John II, the actual King of France, is going to be captured and taken to England as a prisoner of war. The French army is going to fall apart after this. They lose um, morale, and the English are going to win this war temporarily. A peace treaty is going to be signed between King John of France and the King of England. The peace is kept for a little while, but not forever. And fast forward to 1415, the Battle of Agincourt, one of the most famous battles of all time. Uh, the English are greatly outnumbered by the French because the English have come down with dysentery and they're all sick and they're all starting to die. Um, the French are going to meet the English on a recently plowed field in between two stands of trees and the French and the English are going to wait there all day in the rain for each other to fight. Uh, King of <clears throat> sorry, King Henry V of England is going to goad the French into fighting. Basically, King Henry V has his English longbowmen shoot at the French. The French attack. They send their foot soldiers across his muddy field to try and take out the English king. Problem is, the English king, he set his forces up into a V formation. And so all of the French soldiers are going to be funneled down to this middle part. And at that middle part is where Henry V has all of his strongest soldiers. In addition to that, in the trees, Henry V has all of his bowmen. So they're shooting arrows from the sides. Uh, so what happens is all the English are going to funnel the French into that little area where they get so tight they can't swing their swords while the English have all this, this range of motion. Uh, the French are going to turn around and run away and the French cavalry is going to misunderstand what's happening and the cavalry is going to charge right into their own men. Uh, this ends up being a huge defeat for the French and it really does look like the English are going to win this war. Here's another video if you want to watch on your own. It's called The History of England Agincourt. It's another extra hit history video. Once again, a very good one if you need some extra help here. All right, um, so how do the French fight back? Well, a lot of it has to do with Joan of Arc. She was born in 1412, and she was a shepherd. And she was only 17 years old, but she heard voices of saints, supposedly. And... She's going to have these voices tell her that if she can get the Dauphin, which was the prince of France, crowned as king, then France would win. So Joan of Arc is going to get somebody to give her armor. And then Joan of Arc is going to convince somebody to give her their army. And Joan of Arc is going to fight to the city of Orléans and find the Dauphin, Prince Charles. Then Prince Charles and Joan of Arc are going to go to the Cathedral of Rheims. She fights her way there. And it has to be the Cathedral of Rheims because that is where all of the, the kings of France are crowned. So Prince Charles is going to become King Charles. Now to make this even more difficult, uh, the Cathedral at Rheims is in enemy territory. There is a, a group of people known as the Burgundians who are French, but they're loyal to the English king. And she has to fight her way through enemy territory to get Prince Charles crowned as King Charles. Um, after this happens, though, Joan of Arc is going to be captured by the Burgundians. The Burgundians are going to sell her to the English. The English put her on trial for being a witch because she heard voices. And then May 30th, 1431, Joan of Arc is burnt at the stake in the city of Rouen. So how does Joan of Arc encourage people to fight? Well... She stimulates French pride, and it's basically if the 17-year-old shepherd girl can beat the English, we can beat the English too. 
At the same time, this is happening. The English people are starting to demand an end to the war because the war is just costing so much. Uh, Parliament refuses to spend more money. If the fight's going to continue, the, the royal monarchy is going to pay for it themselves. And the English kings, they don't want to spend the money. So by the time the war is over, the only parts of France that are still in English hands, it's the coastal city of Calais in, on the Normandy coast. So what are the actual impacts of the war? Um, believe it or not, there's a big long-term impact. Number one, England devastated financially. France devastated physically. A lot of noble families are killed in England. Thousands of acres of farmland are destroyed in France. The English monarchy is going to be greatly weakened the French monarchy gets greatly stronger. The English monarchy has to turn over power to the English parliament. The French monarchy gets rid of any sort of parliamentary procedure. England is going to end up with the War of Roses, which was a fight for the crown. France, the nobles are killed. There's nobody to stop the French king. And then maybe most importantly, England no longer worried about France. England starts spending money on colonization, which is part of why the United States exists. France, there are so many soldiers and military men killed in France that they have to open up the military to lower levels of nobility, and that's what's going to allow this guy named Napoleon to enter military service about 400 years later. This is a video called Why Was the Hundred Years War So Significant? Also a very good one. It's by Captivating History. Okay, moving on from there, the Renaissance. I'm going to break this up into two different parts. There is a group part called the English Renaissance or Italian Renaissance, and then uh, not the English Renaissance, but the Northern Renaissance. So there's really the Italian Renaissance, the Northern Renaissance, or the Italian Renaissance or the English Renaissance, two different Renaissances that we're going to talk about here. So let's start with the Southern Renaissance, this Italian one. Uh, there are two real big things you got to know about the Renaissance to begin with. Number one, roughly speaking, 1300 to 1600. Uh, it's a gradual period of time. Nobody just wakes up and says, hey, I feel like the Renaissance started today. It's a period of time that takes about 300 years. The other thing is it's a change in the way people think. No longer are they happy with the world being the way it is. Ancient Roman works, ancient Greek works are rediscovered. People fall in love with Greek and Latin languages. People fall in love with Greek and Latin art forms. People basically want to go back to the way things were in ancient Rome, ancient Greece. It's actually the people who feel they're enlightened who create the term Dark Ages to refer to the Middle Ages. The other big question people have is why was it in Italy? Number one reason, Italy is not a united kingdom. It's a series of independent city-states. It's very urban. People live close together and that means ideas can spread. Another big reason is that Italy has a lot of money. With the Catholic Church being based in Italy, a lot of money from around Europe flows into Italy and those people want to spend money. Uh, the bankers for the Catholic Church are the de' Medici family. And the de' Medici family, they're going to basically control Florence. And Florence is going to control Italy. And the de' Medici's are going to spend so much money showing off their wealth. Um, I think the final reason that's going to be in Italy is just Italy surrounded by the ruins of Rome. So Italy has the, the Roman culture. They have memories of Rome and they're seeing all the great Roman artworks and Roman buildings that are left and they kind of just want to go back to when the area was great. All right, so the ideals of the Renaissance, they center on the idea of individualism. And the fact that they are all about individualism, they want attention. They want people to believe that they're important and want their work because they want to make money. A great example of this individualism 
of the Renaissance is the autobiography. Uh, somebody thought their life was so important that you would read a book about them. So they wrote it themselves. I mean, that is about as most individualistic thinking as you can get. Um, the creators, they want, they want publicity. A great example, uh, the Pieta sculpture, everybody when, thought when it was unveiled that it was done by Donatello, but it wasn't. It was actually done by Michelangelo. And Michelangelo, in the middle of the night, he creeps into St. Peter's Cathedral, and he writes Michelangelo, Bu uh, was it Michelangelo Buonarroti, which is his last name, all across the dress of the Virgin Mary. So Renaissance thinkers, they do want attention. Uh, they start dressing fancy. They start taking baths. They start acting fancy. And they start to stand out because they want the attention. They also want to buy things. Being able to show off your wealth was an important thing to those who believed in the Renaissance. And the way paintings were done changes and the ability to paint becomes much more affordable, which means more paintings are out on the market, which means more people can buy them. Then um, because it's all about making money for the first time, the idea that time equals money becomes a thing. So quantification, the, the translation of your time and the world around you into money or just time itself becomes very important. It, this might sound weird, but a great example of this Renaissance quantification is in music. If you are a musician, if you've ever played music, you may be familiar with the, with the musical staff and time signatures. Those are creations of the Renaissance to keep track of time in music. There is a philosophy that goes with the Renaissance, and that is humanism. Uh, it wasn't just enough anymore to exist. Renaissance thinkers felt that you had to have a purpose in life. And very famously, a guy named Erasmus says, to be truly human, one had to be educated, not simply exist. So humanists start to reinterpret ancient Roman and ancient Greek texts. They try to figure out what the different works meant to the original authors. They do not look at it through the more modern Christian lens, and they try to rediscover what it meant to be human. And a good humanist, they, they say, you know, man is still the best of God's creatures, but man is able to be educated and needs to be educated. It's not just simply having a, a, a soul that makes you human. It is having the soul and having knowledge. Renaissance art's pretty famous, and um, you, you may recognize most of these. Uh, you got the Mona Lisa at the top left, the Last Supper at the top right, and then the bottom right is known as the School of Athens. And it's really important to know that because Renaissance art is being purchased by individuals and not the church, that the artist would paint whatever the person wants who is buying the art. So if the purchaser wants a Ferrari in their picture, these artists will make a Ferrari. It doesn't matter. Also, the bodies are going to be presented realistically, really for the first time. In fact, Michelangelo was a grave robber. Uh, I know that sounds weird, but Michelangelo would actually pay people to dig up freshly buried corpses, bring them to him, and Michelangelo would do autopsies on them to figure out how the body works so he could present the body as realistically as possible. Oil paints become a thing. Uh, before this you had frescoes which was basically eggshells and plaster and you had to wait for the eggshells and plaster to completely dry before you could add new layers or new colors. Well, oil paintings they don't mix as easily so you could do different colors while another one is still drying. Also, oil will dry in a lower temperature, meaning that paintings could expand further north and still be done. There are even some artists who are more interested in making money. Uh, Albrecht Dürer, 
Um, he is going to be the inventor of work smarter, not harder. And what he would do is he would carve out wood blocks and then he would basically stamp the wood blocks and mass produce his art and make as much money as he could. And then The Prince by Niccolo Machiavelli. This is widely considered the first political science work in history. Uh, it is also a form of art, of course. And this was written for the de' Medici family of Florence. And it's supposed to be basically a how-to novel for the de' Medici family to keep control of the people of Florence. And he's basically going to say, you have to do what you have to do. Sometimes you give the people a little bit, sometimes you take away from them. Uh, but the important thing is you always have to keep the people on your side. And it's okay to murder if you need to do that. It's okay to betray somebody if you need to do that. Uh, it's okay to give things away if you need to do that. Whatever it is, give the people just enough so that they're loyal to you, whether that's through fear or kindness. All right, uh, the Northern Renaissance. The, the uh, European Renaissance moves north into places like Northern Germany and England. And why? Why does it do that? Well, ideas spread. People come to Italy to study. And there are many universities in the south. And when those students from the northern part of Europe go back home, they bring the ideas with them. So they start to spread. Uh, Spain and France are both going to invade Italy at different points. And the soldiers are going to take ideas. And those ideas are going to go home with them. And then last but not least, uh, movable type. Uh, it becomes cheaper and easier to print things, which means you can make cheaper books, which means books can be produced quicker and in larger numbers. And then that means the ideas in those books are going to spread further and further. How is the Northern Renaissance different? It has, number one, to do with who's actually buying the artwork. In the Southern Renaissance, in the Italian Renaissance, it's mostly individuals who are wealthy and wanting to show off their wealth. The Northern Renaissance doesn't have as many wealthy individuals, but they do have kings, and those kings are going to buy most of the materials. The Northern Renaissance is going to be more Christian. Uh, instead of looking at Greek and Roman works, the Northern Renaissance thinkers are going to look at early church and Christian works and try to reanalyze those. Also, when it comes to artwork, the Southern Renaissance is going to be almost completely freed from church items. Like I said, you could draw a Ferrari or paint a Ferrari, and that's good. Uh, the North, because it's still a little bit more Christian-based, you can draw your Ferrari, but Jesus might be driving it. So that's kind of the difference between the North and the South. The North, also, their version of the Renaissance is going to be open to more people. It's more willing to be accepted by the common people. And I don't want to say they dumbed down the Renaissance for the Northern people, but they kind of do in some ways. The greatest Northern thinker is Erasmus, and that's this guy right here. Uh, he was a Christian scholar who was also a philosopher, and he tries to find ways to blend Christianity and humanism together. So he takes the best parts of humanism, where you want to be educated, you want to be open-minded, with the best parts of Christianity, the faith, hope, and love, and he tries to create something new. Another thing he does is he prepares a new edition of the New Testament. He takes the original Greek retranslates it and tries to come up with a better version of the Christian Bible. And he's also very big into education as well, and he encourages schools to open. Uh, Northern Renaissance art. Uh, here's some examples of it. Uh, the bottom is Albrecht Dürer. The top part, or the top painting is Peter Bruegel. And if you look at the Albrecht Dürer at the bottom, you're going to see just regular people down at the bottom, but at the top you see... Uh, what's supposed to be the Christian God and Jesus there. And Jesus is on a crucifix, but the people down below are just milling about doing business. Uh, the Peter Bruegel, it's called the Slaughter of the Innocents, and it vaguely looks like Romans marching into an ancient Jewish town, but in reality it's supposed to be the Spanish marching into a Belgian town. The Northern Renaissance, it's almost exclusively oil paintings. 
because once again, Fresco cannot dry that far north, so oil will. Uh, just some general things. I know we haven't talked about the um, the Reformation yet, but everybody knows that there's a split in the Catholic Church. Protestants go one way, Catholics go the other. And there's a big difference in the way they view life during the Renaissance. Uh, for example, Catholics, the marriages are going to be rather late, and that's because Catholics needed to have sufficient land before marrying. And so they had to wait until their father either died or, or divided up the land. Uh, in Catholicism, then, it was very easy to get married, but almost impossible to get divorced. Uh, marriage was as easy as just a, a schoolyard promise. Hey, if we're not married in 20 years, let's get married to each other. Uh, in the Catholic Church, they'd be like, okay, you'll be married in 20 years. Uh, divorce, the only way to prove it, a divorce is if you could prove that you never consummated the marriage, meaning, you know, bedtime stuff. And there's lots of grievances in the Catholic Church. There was an entire branch of the Catholic Church that was basically marriage court. Uh, Protestants, they believe that marriage liberated women because it's better to be a married woman than to be a nun. Uh, the Protestants, they didn't look favorably on divorce, but they allowed it to happen. And also Protestants allowed contraception. Even in the Renaissance, contraception was 70% effective. They knew when to... Um, spend time together, they knew when not to spend time together, they knew herbs and drinks that could prevent pregnancy or even stop pregnancy after it has started. So believe it or not, uh, contraception as early as the 1400s, 1500s was 70% effective. A uh, family size. Uh, if you are a woman, you're going to deliver a kid every 24 to 30 months and you're going to have a 10% or more chance of childbirth and the more kids you had, the more that chance went up. Uh, Babies born in the city are more susceptible to disease and pollution and filth, and so they are going to be less likely to survive into adulthood. And if you're a second daughter or more, uh, you're probably going to become a nun because only the first daughter is going to be married off to a family member or a, a suitor of choice. So if you were a second, third, fourth daughter, um, you're going to become a nun. You're going to go to a monastery. Witchcraft. Yes, there was witchcraft. Uh, from the year 1400 to about 1625 or so, there are somewhere between 200 and 250,000 people killed as witches, of which 85% of them were women. Uh, this witchcraft craze was a way that women could keep other women down or they could assert their dominance. And because of this, women don't trust each other. Um, if you've had U.S. history or if you're just familiar with U.S. history, you may have heard of the Salem witch trials in the Massachusetts colonies, or the American colonies, I should say. That was part of this witchcraft phase, but it's the last major witchcraft accusing an outbreak in history. There is a video called uh, Witchcraft Crash Course European History number 10. I'm, of course, not going to make you watch this, that because a video in a video doesn't make any sense, but it's a good video. So if you're interested in witchcraft, please watch that. Uh, Renaissance food, it was not very tasty. It was all either very salty or it was dried like beef jerky. Um, fish like herring would be eaten if you're on the coast. And the only time you really get fresh crops, fresh food, uh, late spring to early autumn, very shortly after um, the harvest. Beans are cooked a lot because beans will absorb the salt. Very often there's a big pot of stuff that people just throw things into and take out. So you have this constant stew or soup that just goes on for weeks and weeks, if not months. Uh, they do have sauces, much like we have ketchup and mustard. They had yellow sauce and green sauce. Uh, the yellow sauce was made with ginger and saffron. The green sauce had ginger, cardamom, cloves, and herbs. Uh, the green sauce was kind of like a pesto. The yellow sauce was kind of like a curry. Um, and pepper, um, just like black pepper, was so valuable that it was used as a currency and the age of exploration very much happens because of the desire and the value of black pepper. All right, uh, we've got table manners too. No forks, everybody ate with their hands. Everybody's hands were dirty. People had lice and, and uh, fleas and everything else. They're scratching and itching at the, at the table. 
but everybody washed their hands. The problem is when they wash their hands, they all dip their hands in the same water. So instead of just directly transferring the, the diseases and the germs from food to food, you did it through the water. So you take your dirty hands, dip them in the water, go eat. And then the next person behind you would dip their hands in your dirty water and then go eat. So table manners were very, very questionable. Uh, two other changes I want to mention, warfare changes. With the invention of gunpowder and the bringing of firearms, it became very expensive to keep an army. And armies were used during the Renaissance as just a last a, a last choice. Uh, conscription happens where you're forcibly uh, drafted in the army. And the idea of the salvo, where you do not shoot your guns all at the same time, it comes out. So like you'd have line one, line two, line three, all in a row. Line one would shoot, line two would shoot, line three would shoot. And while line two and three are shooting, line one would be reloading their weapon and so on and so forth. Then we have the printing press. You have got these movable type blocks. Instead of having to carve out an entire page, you'd carve out just individual letters and those letters are reusable. And then we start using lowercase letters, which means that you can write and type even faster. So books become cheaper to produce, ideas are gonna spread faster, and page numbers are invented so everybody can stay on the same page. All right, um, 36 minutes. Sorry for it being so long, but as you see, it's a lot of stuff. Uh, thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.